thank you for coming out on a rainy afternoon. Um, I'm Larry Rinder. I'm the Director and Chief Curator of the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive, and I'm happy to welcome you to today's program. Um, it was my pleasure to organize this show with Sylvia Fine, and I've grown to just think the world of her and her art, and, uh, and I'm, I know that Garrett, who we're going to hear from in a moment, um, is one of the people who has spent the most time thinking about her work, and uh, he's known her for many years, so it'll be a pleasure to hear his thoughts. Um, Garrett Caples is a San Francisco-based poet, and he's known Sylvia since 2012. Uh, and I think it was, uh, he can correct me if I'm wrong when he gets up here, but I think it was in the wake of her uh, uh, presentation within the groundbreaking show at LACMA uh, that was called In Wonderland, The Surrealist Adventures of Women Artists in Mexico and the United States, uh, in which I believe she was the only living artist. And she, she and Yayoi Kusama. And Yayoi Kusama, okay. So, and, uh, you know, she showed up at the opening, and this is a show with people like Leonora Carrington and Remedios Varro and Frida Kahlo, and there's um, Sylvia Fine uh, in person. Uh, Sylvia, by the way, is not here today. Uh, she turned 100 two weeks ago and is not feeling well. So uh, for those of you who didn't get advance notice from the website, apologies that Sylvia couldn't be here, uh, but Garrett uh, decided to forge ahead and we're grateful to you for turning what would have been a conversation into a presentation. Uh, Garrett has written numerous essays on art, music, and literature, including two essays on Sylvia's art. Uh, one, The Secret Life of Sylvia Fine, appeared in the San Francisco Bay Guardian in 2014, uh, and the other is a chapter in his book, Retrievals, published the same year by Wave Books. Other recent projects of Garrett's include a book of poems, power ballads, and a text accompanying the art book, People Are a Light to Love, memorial drawings by Veronica de Jesus, whose work was featured here about two years ago. Uh, Garrett edited an edition of Preserving Fire, selected po poems by Philip Lamantia, and a new edition of, po of quote, poems from the Greenberg Manuscripts, uh, which is poems by a mysterious fellow named Samuel Greenberg, who you've probably never heard of, but Garrett could tell us about that, too, if he wants to. Uh, he's also an editor at City Lights Books, Books, where he curates the Spotlight uh, Poetry Series. Uh, so thank you, Garrett, for coming all the way over here and telling us your thoughts about Sylvia Fine. Thank you. Well, thank you. <clears throat> all right. So is this uh, microphone good, everyone can hear? Good, 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 all right, all right. So uh, I, as Larry says, uh, Sylvia Fine is 100 years old uh, as of uh, this month, or this past month, rather, uh, in, in, uh, in November. That definitely deserves a round of applause. And. Uh, and I, I, first, uh, I first met Sylvia in 2012, as, he, as Larry says, uh, after the In Wonderland show, because she had about six paintings in there. And, uh, and again, aside from Yayoi Kusama, she was the only living artist in this show. And this was one of the paintings that she had in there that really, uh, um, you know, piqued my interest. And, uh, uh, you know, she is from, uh, I did a little research finding out uh, about her and it turned out that she only lived like 22 miles from me. So it seemed, uh, it seemed inevitable that I needed to go meet her. And, um, uh, and I just, I'm, I'll, I'm gonna come back to this painting, but I just wanted to show it as like, this is the one that really sort of grabbed me because it, uh, I was taken by the, you know, the little objects that she uh, has in her uh, her cigarette. Uh, this is a fun fact for a hundred year old: is that uh, every painting of Sylvia or picture from the '40s that I've seen, she's got a butt going. So she's very much like a known smoker, and yet, yet uh, I don't know when she kicked it, but uh, she uh, she's got good genes. So. Uh, so when I saw this, though, I thought um, I thought of Remedios Varro, and I just wanted to show a couple of Varro paintings. Uh, 
It reminded me of, of, of her work in the sense of, um, like this one, The Vagabond, you know, we have a similar situation of uh, tiny objects, a little picture, a little bookshelf, a little plant, a little uh, pot. And, um, and this one uh, is called uh, Leaving the Psychoanalyst's Office. And again, we got a little basket of, kind of like a sewing basket of various objects. And uh, like, like the previous uh, picture of Sylvia, uh, Varro has a tendency to be the protagonist of her paintings very often. And so that's, that's a self-portrait of, of Varro. Uh, just as gossip, that's Benjamin Pere, who is her lover. Uh, and she's, uh, she's getting, uh, you know, they had a good relationship up until he died even, but you know, she also, also had to kind of throw off the yoke, so she's about to drop him in this little well. So, <laughs> but, so Sylvia. So yeah, I went, we went to go see her in Martinez. Uh, you know, she's a, a fiery little elf of a lady, you know, about this tall. Uh, and uh, that's her dog, Leonardo da Vinci, who I think, sadly think is no longer with us. Um, and I met her and her husband, a man named Bill Schuber, and they had been married for 70 years uh, when we met. And uh, he, he died in 2013, but we got a chance to hang out with him two or three times before then. And I just want to show this picture. This is her in her house in Martinez. It's a kind of, you know, it's a house they built. They, uh, they did pretty well. I wrote in the essay that I wrote about her that, um, you know, Bill had made his fortune in the war as an innovator in medical insurance. So they had, they had a lot of uh, money and they were able to design and build this house. It's got stone walls, as you see. It's, uh, it's a sort of long house with, uh, um, you know, in the center is just one continuous, it's about four rooms with no divisions between them that just flow, flow together. And uh, there's little, you know, bedrooms and stuff off, off to the side. Um, and uh, it's a great painter's house because there's, there's a lot of natural light from up above, but not directly on your paintings. So she gets to uh, have that natural light to paint by without it uh, messing up the pigment. You know, and she's got a, it's a, um, it's essentially a farm. You know, she's got, uh, she's got several acres. She's got olive trees. She's got uh, grapevines. She's got all sorts of vegetables. Um, you know, I have a memory that I know is not true, but I picked vegetables with her once and she, I have a memory of her pulling out a radish out of the ground and eating it. And I'm sure she washed it, washed it off because she's got little spigots and everything. But, but it, that memory is strong to me because that's, you know, she's very much of, she's an organic person of the, of the earth. She's a real farmer. Uh, and uh, so yeah, so let's start with her, her artistic career. Well, she's born in 1919 in Milwaukee. She's, a, um, she's an undergraduate at the University of uh, Wisconsin at Madison. And, uh, and she's a very precocious uh, uh, painter. She and another painter, the person who painted this painting actually, a guy named uh, John Wilde, this man over here, he, uh, they, they were both undergraduates and in 1941 they got a two-person show at the gallery at the university, which is which was very rare for an undergrad to get that kind of treatment. And they soon came into, you know, the sort of uh, the local uh, uh, creative adults. And they had a sort of para, what we call para-surrealist group that was sort of translated, I mean, uh, triangulated between, uh, you know, Chicago, Milwaukee, and Madison. And uh, it was a group of painters. Uh, this is a guy named uh, Carl Preeb. This is Gertrude Abercrombie, Dudley Hupler, Marshall Glazier, and Sylvia. Again, note the cigarette. And uh, uh, I, these are private friends of Mr. Wilders, so uh, I, don't, uh, I don't have anything to say about them. But um, we don't really have time to get into their work, but I just wanted to show, it, show you just a taste of, of it so you see what this group is up to. And so here's a call Preeba. Or Preeb, I'm not sure how you pronounce it. Uh, there's a Gertrude Abercrombie, another self-portraitist. Uh, this is in the 40s, 1940s. And uh, let's see, this is uh, Dudley Hupler. 
So a little later, because Dudley Hupler was a writer, and when World War II broke out, and the whole group gets split up, the able-bodied men get uh, drafted, and uh, that's when Hupler started making visual art. And this is all like pointillist dots. You know, he makes all of his drawings out of just like pencil, pencil dots, uh, and makes little crazy little creatures like that. Uh, and this is Marshall Glazier. He's probably the most famous of the bunch in a way because he had some New York life. He, he was the oldest of this group, kind of the eminence Grease. He went from, uh, uh, went from Madison, ended up in New York City and studied with George Gross at the uh, Art Students League. And he later taught there, um, and it, um, like, you know, much, much, much later. Uh, taught there, and I, th I think he taught uh, Archie Rand. I don't know if you know Archie Rand, but I think Archie took classes from from him. So he's he's a bit known in the in the general art historical world, uh, but most of these people are not. Um, and just that's another John Wilder, uh, just to give you a sense of what he was doing when he wasn't painting his friends. Uh, and here's a Sylvia Fine. This also was in the In Wonderland show in L.A. This one's called the Tea Party. And uh, I wanted to show this one just because it's, uh, it's, it illustrates uh, her, um, her, she's got very intense, what you would call maybe academic training. Like uh, she studied with a person at uh, the University of Wisconsin named James Watros. And he was a art historian and a muralist. And he also, um, he made his students go back to like Renaissance and medieval recipes for pigments and make paint according to these very ancient techniques. And so this is made from a 15th century recipe, the paint on this. Uh, and it, it um, let's see, it, it, the recipe calls for wood ashes, fish gum, and whale wax, among other things. So it, you know, pretty intensive training. And it shows you so, somewhat where Sylvia is coming from. Uh, because Sylvia paints, in, with uh, egg tempera, which is a, um, you know, it's just p pigment and uh, I think it's a one, one to one egg uh, water ratio that's in the jug there. And she has this, you know, little palette here, the ground pigment. And, you know, you take, take some fluid from the jug, mix it with some, some, uh, some pigment and you, uh, you have paint. And so if you open her refrigerator, you'll run across her paint. Um, and, uh, you know, again, this is a not, this was not a, um, a modernist thing to do by the usual measure of that uh, type of thing. It was considered an old fashioned uh, method of painting. Um, but Sylvia just doesn't care about any of that. You know, she's an artist. She does whatever the hell she wants when she wants to do it. So she never had any hesitation about, she very much went all in on egg tempera. And all the works you see in the show are egg tempera paintings. Um, and so I wanted to, so in the early 40s, uh, uh, well, it was the mid 30s, but uh, in the early 40s, uh, surrealism sort of hits the USA because, uh, because of World War II. A lot of, um, a lot of people are fleeing the, uh, you know, occupied Paris, fleeing the Nazis, and um, uh, among the people, Dali had already been making inroads in uh, in the United States. Like he saw, he saw where the writing on the wall was in terms of world power and money. And uh, persistence of memory. This uh, this was purchased in 1934 by MoMA, and um, this is 1936. This is the fourth issue of Life magazine, and it was printed in color. And this was kind of like the introduction, in a way, to surrealism for a for, uh, mainstream American audience. And we got a little Magritte, and we got a Picasso. Uh, and, uh, you know, he's also on the cover of Time magazine and stuff. But when things get really hot in Europe around 1940, he moves to America. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, in 1941, though, André Breton and a lot of the a lot of the group uh, who were still over there came over to New York City. And so you have this weird kind of situation where surrealism hits as, as a 
pop, pop cultural phenomenon. Like it affects film, it affects uh, advertising. Dali does an advertisement for Schiaparelli perfume. Uh, and, but it also hits as an avant-garde high art movement. And this magazine right here is, uh, this is called Triple V. It was, uh, it was uh, Andre Breton's magazine in exile, the surrealist group in exile, uh, their magazine. It was, um, I think, Duchamp and Max Ernst and Breton are the editors of this. And as you can see up here, Sylvia Fine Schuber, this is uh, her copy. And she, she gave me this copy a few years ago. And conveniently, in this copy on the flyleaf, she had written these four names. Which uh, Eleanor Fini, which is, uh, you know, Leonor Fini, she's probably misremembering it. Uh, Dorothea Tanning, Jacqueline Lamba, and Leonora Carrington. And that's incredibly useful information if you're thinking about somebody's uh, painting. And um, just to show you real quick, this, that's a Fini, that's, uh, that's a Tanning, and I know that's, that painting is reproduced in that issue of Triple V. That's a Jacqueline Lamba, it's a Dor Dorothea Carrington. Or Dorothy Car or Leonor Carrington, sorry. Uh, and ju just a glimpse of that to, to show you. And so what Sylvia is doing in the early 40s is something like this. And, and just to give you a sense of what's going on, as I say, World War II has broken out, in fact, today, uh, you know, uh, December 7th, uh, a day that will live in infamy if I screw this lecture up. <laughs> and um, it... Uh, uh, Bill got drafted, uh, Dudley Hupler and Carl Preeb and uh, um, uh, John Wilder got drafted. Marshall Glazer was too old and weird, so he didn't get drafted. Uh, but um, so Sylvia was a war bride, essentially. She gets married and Bill immediately ships out to Guam or something like that. Or he goes, I think he's in Australia first and then Guam. And so she painted this, this sort of... Uh, mythical painting as a kind of talisman to protect him overseas. You know, and he's, he's depicted as a knight. He's got this chain mail uh, outfit on. He's got this uh, eye on his breastplate that is, uh, you know, to ward off the evil eye. He's got his weapon and his provisions and whatnot. Um, and uh, he's got a little, I think this is some sort of Australian bird that uh, Sylvia added. And that is uh, Sylvia. And uh, just before we leave this, this uh, shot, uh, note the feet, because the feet, the feet come back uh, in, uh, in, late, in her late uh, career here. The feet are very important. But, uh, and just to give you a closer look at uh, what's going on with her painting, if you see uh, sort of between the legs here, over here, there's a lot of what you might call like hypnagogic imagery going on here, like little scenes of, uh, you know, suffering and whatnot. You know, it's sort of reflecting the backdrop of uh, World War II. And, uh, you know, she's influenced by painters um, like Hieronymus Bosch, say, you know, with like one of his hellscapes that will have all these tortures and stuff. But this is a sort of more abstract kind of... Uh, uh, purchase on that type of material. And um, uh, this background, uh, in a way, points, points more towards the future of her painting than the, the actual uh, scenes, because the scenes, she will eventually ab abandon uh, this, these sort of mythological uh, scenes. But, um, but yeah, so, uh, and you know, I just want to point out, she's very, Sylvia's a very sort of uh, sensual, erotic person, and she's doing things that uh, would happen in like Renaissance painting, say like, uh, you know, his provisions here are a bunch of carrots, which is sort of a displacement of the, uh, of the penis there. Um, you know, and she, so she's very much attuned to that style of, uh, you know, it's at once very understated and at once uh, terribly explicit. Uh, so just a, there's another painting from the same period, uh, lady in a cage, you know, sort of depicting her suffering with all of her friends and her husband away. 
Um, I don't want to spend too much time on this except to note the, uh, the pomegranates, because the pomegranates are a big, big thing for Sylvia. Uh, she, you know, she and a lot of these painters, they had their own sort of personal mythologies that they would depict in, uh, in their paintings. And hers, this is related to uh, the myth of uh, Persephone and uh, Demeter. Um, and it's a, the, the origin myth for the seasons and why there's a, why there's a winter. Uh, because what happens is uh, Hades steals Persephone, brings her, brings her down to the underworld, and tricks her into eating a pomegranate seed. And then that's why for three months of the year, there's no, there's no growth because uh, Persephone has to be in uh, the, the underworld, and Demeter's too sad to make any food happen. So, uh, so that, that's all we need to know there. But the, the, uh, they will keep turning up the uh, pomegranates. Now, in, in the mid-40s, mid she goes to Mexico. Uh, she, get, she gets a job. I think, I think she told me her uncle had a, some sort of company that she could do some stuff at. And she's in this place, uh, Ahihik. I think. Is that right? Ahihik. Yeah, and this girl from Ahihik. You know, and you see her art is changing a bit. And it's getting, uh, getting a little darker here. And... Um, and this is so, and she stays there until after the war. Even Bill, actually, when he demobilizes, he comes to uh, Mexico City, and they live in Mexico City for a while. Uh, so they're in Mexico from forty-three to forty-seven. Oops. Uh, and in the this, this painting is in the show, and it's one of the, uh, you know, from her Mexican period, and it's called Island for Cats. It's a very uh, a very Sylvia thing to depict. She, you know, she, in addition to Leonardo da Vinci, there were plenty of just cats wandering around her property. And you can see the cats are these little tiny guys here and here. And, uh, you know, I would recommend, yeah, looking at this painting for a while. Uh, there's a lot of detail in it. You know, there's a uh, fish there. There's some people swimming here, a little guy up there. Um, you know, a little town on the shore. Uh, and, you know, this is not a very big painting. She gets a lot of detail into a very short amount of space. But I was struck by this because, again, when I first turned on to Sylvia, I always thought of Remedios Varro. And these are a couple of Varro paintings. This one's from the 30s called uh, Souls of the Mountain. But that one makes me think of this one, obviously, Cat's Paradise. Like, she treats the same theme, even. They're very similar sensibility between them. But you can see, like, Varro is much more, like, mechanical, uh, and um, mathematical in the way she depicts things, whereas Sylvia, Sylvia is much more like organic and wild in the way that she will uh, depict something. She's much more of a farmer, whereas uh, uh, Varro is more of a a, uh, a mathematician scientist type. But uh, so this is lady lady with the with a baby. This is. Uh, one of the paintings she paints when she comes back to the U.S. and she has a child. Uh, and uh, the, it was the first painting I showed. And uh, if you notice up here, uh, this is a pomegranate. So uh, Heidi, this is her baby, Heidi. And uh, it's interesting to me because the pomegranate, at a certain point, uh, Sylvia, she's in the sort of Persephone role in the uh, earlier paintings. And here, now she's kind of in the Demeter role, and her, uh, her baby is in the uh, Persephone role. Um, but you just see, yeah, how things uh, develop in her painting after coming back from, uh, from Mexico. And you also just see, you know, there's a lot of angst in Sylvia's painting as well. Um, you know, I don't think she found motherhood easy. Uh, you know, and it's the sort of thing, it's hard. You know, if you're, if you're an artist, and you have a kid on your mind all the time. Uh, it's a hard, you know, I'm sure many people in the audience, I know a few, have dealt with this. Uh, you know, so I think there's a lot of psychic uh, burdens that uh, Sylvia had that, um, but I showed, wanted to show that one because this one relates to one that we see in the show, which is uh, Sylvia with baby Heidi. And as you can see, it's a similar, similar theme, very different treatment of it. It's painted a couple of years later. We got our pomegranate, still here. Uh, this painting is so tiny, like you'll never see it this big again. So, 
enjoy it. Uh, but yeah, we got a little mountain over here. We got a little building and a flag. Uh, it's kind of unreal. I think she said, uh, or I read somewhere that she she painted did a lot of these miniatures with like one hair brushes. You know, it's like that's the type of she's this kind of virtuoso technical painter. Um, and uh, and this and it, but it also shows you she returns to themes uh, over and over, and like she she'll work on a theme and approach it from different angles. Because like, you know, at this point in 1949, uh, her daughter is already two, so it's not you know she's already past this phase. But visually, Sylvia is still still working out this type of composition. Um, and I'll just show this one real quick. It's another. This is a big for her. This is a really big painting. Uh, it's called Mama's Music Class, and it's kind of the culmination of this period, these kind of mythic uh, uh, portrait periods. And uh, it's unclear, this might be her mother, or this might be her mother. This looks very much like Sylvia depicts herself in paintings. And, uh, uh, but this is like a you know, Victorian uh, music class, essentially. Um, and you can see in the back, it's very Bosch-like, or very much like the Leonora Carrington I showed, like the sort of very manicured gardens and uh, that sort of thing. Little uh, Emerald City back there. Uh, so yes, so then in the late 40s, uh, she, moves, she moves out to California, uh, basically the Bay Area. And um, she's successful. She's got, a, she's got a gallery in New York. She starts at the Pearl's Gallery, and she ends up at uh, Fine Garden, uh, and she she shows she shows that Fine Garden through the late '60s, I believe. And uh, but this is where her painting starts to go into into these sort of landscapes that aren't aren't like um, you know aren't transcriptions or re representational versions of landscapes, but are these sort of imaginative, transformed landscapes. That's a Release Valley Walnut Orchard. And this is a view of the valley. Uh, this, I believe, is, is Heidi and her dog. There are other paintings with uh, this girl and this dog. And um, uh, yeah, and I th Heidi would be about nine at this point, I think. So uh, it seems, seems to uh, check out. And uh, this is an incredible amount of detail in this painting, if you go look at it in person. Uh, all these uh, buildings and uh, you know horses, lots of horses, because Heidi uh, Heidi was very much into horses, so I think she uh, she would depict uh, depict horses and again. That sort of like personal mythological symbolism, you know. So Heidi is very much associated with the horse, and that's why she uh, we have that. And uh, and then she does landscapes, and then. In the 60s, she's doing a lot of seascapes, this painting also in the show. And, uh, you know, at a, at a certain point, she, you know, uh, Bill really killed it with, in the insurance industry. Like, he really, he really made a lot of money. And so they, they really had a nice life. And at some point, they're uh, spending a lot of time just sailing around on a boat. And, you know, that's a hard place to paint. So she goes very miniature in the... Uh, during the, the the period where she lives on the boat, and and this another thing, you know, it's it seems like it's well, it's nominally a representation of the sea, but it's also like this imaginative rendering of something still that is never still, you know. And the shape of the sea is a kind of uh, oops, sorry, shape of the sea is kind of a joke about that. The sea doesn't have a shape, you know. It's constant, or it has many many shapes, you know, and. You also notice there's a lot of birds in this painting that um, there's always some little beings in these nature nature things. It's very much like a you know like a, a Chinese painting or something like that, where like it's a big landscape and then you you see the person sort of situated in the landscape or the, you know. And so she uh, she's very much of this uh, of this school. But at the end of the End of the 60s, beginning of the 70s, she stops painting. And she stops painting for about 30 years. And I don't really have time to go into this because I don't want to, you know, I don't want to keep us here all day. But, um, 
She wrote two books. Uh, this one, oops, uh, called Heidi's Horse, and uh, this one called First Drawings, Genesis of Visual Thinking. And um, she, she came under the influence out here of an um, uh, artist and art educator named Henry Schaefer Simmern, who's uh, uh, another person fled from the Nazis and uh, ended up, he ended up out here. He, started a, he taught at Berkeley for a minute, and they, they thought he was too weird, so he started his own uh, school called the Institute of Art Education in Berkeley here. And it was just, it was, on the one hand, it was teaching just lay people how to draw, but on the other hand, it was also teaching uh, students how to become art educators. And, uh, and he had a whole model that was very different from uh, uh, prevailing models. I can talk about, the, if we want to talk about this later, we can, there's a lot of detail in it, but it's just to say, you know, Sylvia, um, you know, she might have stopped painting, but she did not stop being a creative person. Uh, you know, she, and she claims she's not a natural writer and that it was very difficult to write these two books. And they're very, you know, they're very ambitious. Heidi's Horse, I'll just dwell on for a second, is, uh, uh, is a study of drawings her daughter made from, you know, pretty much toddlerhood through like about age 14. And, uh, and it worked in terms of thinking through some of the art education theories that uh, Schaefer Simmern had, because his whole, his philosophy of doing it was basically art, the, you know, the process of being an artist is that you self-generate problems and then you self-generate solutions. So it wasn't about teaching intensive techniques, it was about, you know, what have you, what have you drawn or painted or sculpted? What do you like about it? What, what do you not like about it? Or what would you change? And that's how he, he approached things. And, and uh, so you, you get the whole development of, uh, of her daughter as, as an artist. Uh, and just, just as a side note of about Sylvia's artistic life at this, this time, she told me when she wrote that book, um, there are about 250 drawings in Heidi's Horse. And when she was starting to write the book, just to think about it, she drew them all. She redrew every drawing that her daughter <laughs> made. That's the kind of, uh, that's, her, that's her not doing art. Uh, and, uh, and following the second book, this third book was just, this is a posthumous collection of uh, Henry Schaefer Simmer and that uh, various students of his put together. And she provided the illustrations for it. And there are hundreds of illustrations in that book. So it just shows you, yeah, she never, you know, despite the idea that oh, she might have stopped painting, you know, she did not stop being an artist. And sometime around 2000, 2003, she, uh, she picks, picks it up again. And uh, this is a landscape from 2007. And uh, this is why I picked that earlier uh, Souls of the Mountain uh, Varro painting just because I'm struck always by the parallels in their sensibilities. You know, those were these people like in these mountains and this has all these, uh, each mountain has a little, or each hill has a little eye in it, you know. And it's an extraordinary painting. I mean, I don't know if you've ever been to Martinez. It doesn't really look like that, you know. <laughs> like, she's not really a landscape painter in any kind of conventional sense, even though she, you know, that's nominally what these are. And, or another painting from 2012, also in the show, the painting told me what to do. And that's a very kind of uh, surrealist uh, purchase on making art, is that you're, ta you're taking it, the art is telling you what to do, you're not deciding what to do. Um, and so I wanted to, uh, just for the, for the end of the thing, just discuss uh, her relationship with surrealism, just because she, she claimed, claimed very early on uh, that, you know, she's not a surrealist or any kind of ist. Like she wrote in a Guggenheim application, I reject classification as a surrealist or a magical realist or American romantic, though the equipment I use in my work will ever be founded on my ranging imagination and will never acquiesce to the fact alone, which concerns so much of American art production. Although it concerns me much now in the work whereby I earn my living, advertising, I reject it in my own painting. And um, 
you know, I feel like this, this pr the primacy she puts on the imagination and what we see, the, the transformations the imagination does, makes her work, her work fits, fits within surrealism in terms of trying to place her in 20th century American art. Surrealism is still the best interface uh, for, for Sylvia. I mean, it's, uh, you know, and she, she has sort of said she's not a surrealist. Also, she said that in 1943 when being a surrealist was much more like being a member of an organization as opposed to uh, just I'm into surrealism. So um, uh, this is uh, one of her uh, later paintings also in the show, Homage to the Olive. And um, again, you see, you see the, uh, the role of imagination in seeing for Sylvia. We have a, the pupil here. It's a nice little olive, and she's very much obsessed with the, her olive uh, crop every year. It says, you know, her, her farming life is as important to her, I think, as her, her painting life, you know. And also when she wasn't painting, the other thing she's doing is building, building this house, making this huge farm, the whole, the whole business. Uh, and she went through a series of these eye paintings, and they are... Again, it's nominally a representational painting, but a lot of the, a lot of the action of Sylvia's paintings is in, is purely in the paint itself and what's going on, and the sort of, uh, you know, egg tempera. You 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 apply like lots of layers, uh, uh, lots of thin layers over, over on top of each other, and um, that, um, you know, gets a lot of depth into. Paintings that are painted on, it's all painted on a uh, masonite, you know, it's just a flat board, you know, but she, she, uh, she can go deep into that, uh, into that board, you know. And, you know, thinking about Sylvia's work, um, you know, the, the history of the late, late 20th century uh, American art criticism, they oppose you know, figuration or representation or what have you to abstraction. And, you know, and they were, those were sort of set up as, uh, as kind of camps of art. And um, in a book, uh, book called 20 Years of Surrealism, 1939 to 59, there was an official history of the group by one of the members at the time, a history of their post-war activities. Uh, they talk about... Uh, you know, since surrealist painting began, one could say that all the tendencies of plastic expression coexisted in the interior of surrealism. Surrealism does not impose any formal criterion on the, on the artist. On the contrary, it demands that the artist become the creator of new forms, the explorer of, ne of the never before seen. And I feel like this is the, this is the terrain that, uh, that Sylvia's painting uh, takes place on. Here's another painting. This is a very tiny painting, so you'll never see it this big again. Uh, this is dandelion eye, and it's another thing like the olive eye, where it's a juxtaposition of uh, you know of the natural world around her with uh, you know with the the eye the eye of observation itself. I was struck by this one because she has different eyes, obviously, like the olive eye is a different eye, but this eye is basically the same eye that's on that's in that uh, lady with the white knight. It's it's almost exactly the same. Uh, you know, so she she remarkably consistent over a period of uh, of uh, you know what is that seventy years or so, um, and then if we can look at this one. I was glad Larry uh, put this one in the show. I know this one. I think she thinks is one of her important ones because it's in her kitchen. You know, she always <laughs> she always has it around, and uh, this is again why I, I like to think of Sylvia as somebody who refuses uh, the divide between representation and abstraction. Because what the hell is this? You know, it's, it's called musical sky eyes. And there's some eyes here, I guess. And they're kind of floating. Are they underwater? Are they in the, in the sky? There's no, you know, there's, <laughs> this, is, this isn't a picture of anything that previously existed before it existed. Uh, or a painting like this. This one is a little hard to reproduce, so go check it out in the room afterwards. It, it's, it's a bit, it's a darker, it gets washed out in a photo, but this is a Cree de Lowe. It's another eye sort of floating in some atmosphere that is possibly, 
possibly the sea, and shedding tears into the sea. You know, I mean, that's why I don't, I don't think the, uh, the usual ways of, uh, of discussing abstraction versus representation apply to her and why I think she's a surrealist. This is another one. Larry bought this one very shrewdly at the uh, 2014 retrospective she had at uh, this Crow's Work gallery. And this painting is up in the Strange Show. So after you look at Sylvia's stuff, if you haven't seen it already, go into the Strange Show, and this painting is there. And again, what the hell is this? It's an eye, uh, but you know, it's sort of it's sort of moored to these two little other eyes, or what have you, and it's floating in some kind of atmosphere that you know has has a horizon of sorts, and there's a lot you know lot going on in terms of just pure paint. So I mean, that, that's the um, that's most of what I wanted to say. To just close it, I wanted to just look at a, at this quick series. Uh, after her husband Bill died, she um, she started painting these trees, like these memorial trees. And this was the first one, and it's called uh, for WKS, which is uh, William K. Uh, Schuber. I think I shall never see a tree as lovely as thee. And that, that set off a whole series of paintings. She does one of, this is a self-portrait, self-portrait as tree. And if you look at this, this is our old friend from 19, uh, 1942, the feet. These are Sylvia's feet returning to a uh, thing, bound together. Here's Bill and Sylvia again. And close it out on this together forever. And you see this, and again, this is a very erotic sensibility she has. You know, like they're sort of these they're bound in time. Because I mean, these are clearly Bill's feet, these are her feet. So they're, you know, they are united in this tree. Uh, and um, yeah, so I mean that's that's just what I want to show. I thought that was a good way to end it, to just show the continuities that um that have existed in her work from, uh, from all the way back in the 40s till now. And uh, yeah, that, that was about thir 38 minutes. So um, I guess uh, any uh, questions or anything anybody need to, questions or observations? We get, we get a mic for you there. Well, I remember at the show at Crow's Works, Jasmine said someone else had curated the show. I don't remember who. I think it was. that was uh, Travis Nickel. I think who uh, he did a lot of work with with Jasmine. Uh, they both um, they both started at the Weinstein Gallery, which is a great sort of surrealist uh, oriented gallery in the city, and um, uh, they they became Onslow Ford's dealers. There's a lovely Onslow Ford in in the Strange Show as well. Uh, you, so. Um, yeah, so I believe I believe they did that together, you know, with input from Sylvia, um, and, uh, that, and that was a, that was a really amazing show. That was like five years ago, it was January two thousand fourteen, I believe, and um, and yeah, you know, she just one of the great things about that show uh, and this this current one is like she's finally like really emerged after, you know having this completely unconventional career and refusing all of the things that she was supposed to worry about as a professional artist, you know, she's still, you know, people, people are coming around to her. It's slow, it takes a while, but, you know, the fact that, uh, you know, we've gone, we've gone to, we went to a major retrospective in a, in a gallery and now it's sort of a mini retrospective in a museum, you know, this is, this is how it works. So I'm, you know, I'm thrilled to, that uh, that Larry staged that show, really. So, any uh, any other thoughts? Sorry. Oh, go ahead. No. Well, this one has this. To the microphone. Yeah, this one has, and some others have this same kind of almost that almost figurative ground that you see in that um, knight painting yeah. of the white knight, but it's like almost all these little figures. Even up in the tree. And yeah, and that, that's kind of what I was trying to get at when I said like the, the future of her painting was in the background of the White Knight painting rather than the scene itself, was that 
this is where her art will end up. And there's a lot of, yeah, sort of, uh, I always, you know, I don't, I don't know what a good term for it is. I've been calling it hypnagogic imagery, but where you see these things sort of emerge dreamlike out of these, uh, out of these textures, so. Well, the only other thing I wanted to say is that I, I totally agree that all those landscapes are invented, but Martinez and Walnut Creek and all those places were just like cow town, like ag towns with hardly anything out there. Oh, yeah. Just, yeah. you know, like 60 years ago. And that's something nobody today can even fathom because it's just populated everywhere. But there were just landscape as far as the eye could see. Yeah, and the, pa the part of... of um... <laughs> Part of Martinez Sylvia lives in is kind of still like that because she lives in a place. It's actually it's an unincorporated hamlet outside of Martinez, really, and it's called uh, Alhambra Valley. And I don't I don't understand the ins and outs of it in terms of how it works, but it's like if you have a spread there, it has to be a minimum of a five acre spread, and it's to it was to sort of preserve at least part of that. Uh, thing as, as a, um, you know, as a, as a sort of farming community, a rural environment landscape, like uh, it was very much, uh, uh, you know, deliberate by whoever set up that, that little town or, or whatever. And Martinez has recently tried to, they've made overtures trying to take it over. They do do some of the administration for the town. Uh, and, you know, the, they just fought it because they were going to change all the rules and change like you know what kind of dwelling you could have there and stuff, and then yeah, we just you know it'd end up looking it'd be a Starbucks in the middle of this tree, you know. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah, oh, she's she amazing. was she's amazing. she was great. Yeah, yeah. So thank you, Garrett. Great talk. Really enjoyed it a lot. Um, I'm curious if you've ever heard from Sylvia anything about her relationship to Bay Area artists. Um, you know, she moved here, I think, in 51 or something like that, or got her MFA from Cal in 51. Yeah. So she must have had some involvement with other artists here, but I can't figure it out. Well, I think so, some of that goes to um, the... She got really involved with that Henry Schaefer Simmern uh, and his sort of art education movement. And so, and you know, the, all those people were artists and teachers too. So a lot, there was a lot of uh, activity around that for her, I know. Um, there was also, you know, you'd think it makes, like, you know, she hang out with Onslow Ford, like, you'd think that's a no-brainer. You know, they're both these surrealist influenced people, but I don't really know. I mean, the, and it's hard, you know, she's, she's hard, it's hard to pry information out of Sylvia. But um, they had friends in common. Like um, two of Sylvia's biggest friends are artists, but not visual artists. They were, you know, you'd know this. Uh, Harry Parch, the musician, and um, Anna Halperin, uh, the dancer, who's still alive. Anna Halperin, I assume, is 100. I think she's the They're same. They're the same age. Yeah, she's the same age as, as Sylvia. She is still alive and, you know, doing her thing. Uh, you know, she's an amazing dancer, and her, her husband, who is deceased? He uh, he's the person who designed Sea Ranch, uh, and and um, she, so she she was a big uh, friend of his, and Harry Parch was a big friend of his, and I know Harry Parch and Onslow Ford were were good friends. So, but yeah, uh, she's a bit gnomic in that way, like in terms of trying to figure do, that out. Do I recall correctly that she actually did some work for Harry Parch, building his instruments or something along those she lines? She might have, because I. I've I've had the pleasure of knowing a few people who knew Harry Parch, and uh, it seems like it seems like if you knew him, you had to do that. You know, you got drawn into you got drawn into making that. Uh, that poet Richard Moore, Richard O. Moore, who uh, did the uh, poet USA poetry films and stuff, he's another friend of uh, Parch, and he described it the same same way. Yeah, that he would involve you in, in that stuff. Um, I just had a quick question. I don't know if this is. I'm just wondering if you know. Um, I just can't help but think if she was down in Mexico and doing her art down there, 
if she came across Frida Kahlo and if you know anything about that. I'm not... Because, yeah. you know, I mean, Frida's work obviously has a lot of the same similarities. Yeah, you know? I mean, fr Frida... Like, Sin. Uh, Ahihik, I think, right? Uh, was the, the, the town Ahihik. Uh, ah ah Ahihik. Uh, I know that was a kind of colony of, of ours. I, I think, though, there were a lot of, like, um, you know, Americans and English people who, you know, had their little art colonies down there. And I know that's, that's been a hot spot for American visitors. It turn, you know, it turns out, coincidentally, it's the same town. Uh, there's a poet we published at City Lights. Um, named John Hoffman, who is, uh, he is one of the, one of the best minds of my generation and Howell, you know, that list of things. One of those lines is about, is about John Hoffman. And he, uh, he died in Mexico under very mysterious circumstances to the point where they burned his body, which they didn't usually do in Mexico, but they didn't, they didn't know how he died. So they just, in case he had some kind of communicable disease, uh, they burned his body and he, he died in uh, Ahihik as well. So it's like, I know that was a p place that people, people went to. I've never heard Sylvia mention Kahlo as such, but I mean, it's the same, you know, it's part of that mov movement of surrealist women who are the, the protagonists of their own paintings. And um, I have always been at her about Remedios Varro, just because I, I sense the real affinities there. Although, you know, in researching this and, uh, and also just talking to her, um, it really is a kind of parallel, coincidental kind of uh, relationship because, you know, Sylvia gets to Mexico in 43 and Varro only gets there in 42. And Varro doesn't really hit to the point where she would have any kind of reproductions until 55. She has a big show, Mexico in 55. But then one of Sylvia's Mexican friends sent her a bunch of these Varro postcards. It's like, look at this, this woman. This is a, like what you do. And that was the first time Sylvia had, uh, had heard of her. Um, and yeah, and I think Sylvia's alive to the, the parallels there. I don't think she likes to talk about it because, uh, you know, <laughs> she doesn't like to talk about anything about art except, you know, she's like, paintings are from, when she canceled on me, she said, paintings are for looking, not for talking. So. <laughs> Kira, when you were um, talking about the importance of the imagination to her, uh, it made me wonder whether in your conversations with her she had ever talked about various surrealist um, discussions, ideas, polemics, uh, different points of view about uh, how imagination is accessed, how it works in different works of art, anything like that, among various groups of surrealists. Yeah, I mean, I... <laughs> Most of what I've heard of her talk about, uh, you know, sort of I ideas about art making have been tied to that uh, Henry Schaefer Simmer. That, that, that seems like, I don't, my impression was she was interested in surrealism as a, um, you know, as a, as a type of art, uh, if we can call it that. Um, but that she, you know, when she says she's not a surrealist, I think she wasn't really interested in the surrealist uh, manifestos and things like that. But then at the same time, she says stuff like, you know, that imagination quote that she says, it just reminded me of uh, Andre Breton's quote that Barbara Guest quotes at the end of Forces of Imagination. The, to imagine is to see. You know, that's Sylvia all over, you know. So, I mean, I don't, yeah, my impression was that she was kind of aloof from that and I think she also felt like she didn't understand it. She had a kind of, one of the things she liked about uh, Schaefer Simmern was that it's all about visual thinking. And she was, she, she always felt like I think visually rather than uh, verbally. And so that there was more of a hook there for her rather than, uh, you know, as far as I know, as far as I know about, uh, you know, uh, very surrealist writings. You know, I think she was much more just in interested in the visual possibilities it opened up in painting, you know. Uh, any, anyone else? Or? Well, thank you, Gareth. Yeah, we can call that a day.